<sighs> so I had an interesting meeting yesterday with an endocrinologist. And it turns out he's an, a neuroendocrinologist, and he shared with me early on his view of uh, uh, diabetes. He, he actually uh, said he believes the vast majority of diabetes is caused by stress, uh, recurrent stress, and our reactions to stress. Um, that sounds kind of weird. The next connection that you have to make, though, would be that if that's the case, then the vast majority of heart attacks and strokes, and therefore disability in this country and other countries in the world now, uh, and uh, dementia, are related to stress. So <clears throat> it turns out he's a neuroendocrinologist. Uh, he went on to share with me that as an endocrinologist, he gets a lot of patients that come into him uh, with very advanced diabetes, uh, requiring uh, more than 100 units of insulin per day. His perspective is in a healthy state, you don't make that much insulin, so he gets all of his patients off of anything over 100 units. And so the next question is, so how do you, if they need more, what do you do? He, of course, uses things like uh, GLPs, uh, the GLPs, but most of all, he uses um, mental health medications, mostly the SSRIs. For those of you that don't, uh, the connection of SSRIs doesn't make, uh, doesn't get you there. It's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and that probably didn't add a whole lot of folks. It's like Prozac. It's the, um, the modern antidepressants. So here you've got a neuroendocrinologist um, <clears throat> giving antidepressants for diabetes. Now let's, uh, let's talk about how he made those connections. Uh, but before we do, uh, a brief introduction. My name is Ford Brewer, F-O-R-D Brewer, B-R-E-W-E-R, -E with PrevMed, uh, heart attack, stroke, cancer, uh, disability, dementia prevention. Um, we help folks uh, look at ways of preventing all these disablers and uh, killers instead of trying to uh, treat them after the fact. Now, <clears throat> neuroendocrinology. Why would an endocrinologist think that diabetes, all diabetes, and therefore uh, most heart attack, stroke, disability, and dementia comes from stress? Well, let's look at this um, model of a brain. This is not actually not a model. It is a uh, preserved brain. Uh, it, sections of the brain have been dyed to help uh, show components of it. We're not going to go too deep into it. This is the cortex. That's the largest part of the, uh, the human brain, and that's the part we think with. Um, <clears throat> right under that is uh, the corpus callosum. That's the connection between the two sides the right and left side of the cortex. But right under that is the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland. These are the areas that connect our thinking to our neurovegetative signs. So let's uh, connect those dots for a second. Um, <clears throat> thinking, you know, one plus one equals three. Oh, there's a bear uh, after me. You know, different images that you create uh, in, your, um, in your world, whether correct or incorrect, then those get translated and brought down to the center which controls neurovegetative uh, signs and symptoms. What are, what are the neurovegetative signs? I mentioned those a couple of times. Put those together, the, the brain and vegetative, um, the vegetative uh, signs. Their appetites, such as food appetite, sleep appetite, sex appetite. We mentioned the pineal gland. It's right there. The pineal gland, you may remember in our discussions about sleep, the pineal gland is what releases melatonin to help us sleep at night. So, <clears throat> there are connections then between the cortex, the uh, thalamus, hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland, in case you haven't um, 
uh, read about it recently, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland release all, they're the control center for our endocrine system. So um, thyroid uh, stimulating hormone, TSH, that comes from, the, uh, from this area in the midbrain, the, the um, hypothalamus and pituitary. Um, <clears throat> adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, the hormone which causes stimulation of the adrenal glands. And what do the adrenal glands make? They make epinephrine and they make cortisol. So, as you begin to think about these areas, and you begin to think about what the, this uh, neuroendocrinologist was saying, it begins to make a little bit more sense. We begin to connect the dots from the cortex, which recognizes that there is a bear running after me, down to the uh, hy hypothalamus, uh, thalamus, hypothalamus, uh, stimulating uh, the adrenal gland, ACTH, and um, the adrenal glands stimulating epinephrine and cortisol. Now, <clears throat> actually, when, you, when you're in the episode where a bear is chasing you, you don't go through all of the hypothalamic uh, business and the adrenal corticotropic hormone business. You go straight to the adrenal glands. Now, and release epinephrine and cortisol. But after multiple um, episodes of being stimulated and going under stress, uh, multiple times per hour, multiple hours per day, multiple days per week, multiple weeks per year, uh, year after year, decade after decade, you get stimulation of the adrenal glands. And repeated stim uh, stimulation of cortisol. So this is just a diagram <clears throat> which creates some more connections about this midbrain section. Uh, this midbrain includes also the, uh, this is the thalamus, it includes the basal ganglia which are involved in Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Uh, they put large movements together. You notice the hippocampus is right here as well. And the hippocampus is critical for memory development uh, when we talked about uh, dementia and cognitive decline, we actually get a, a, a volume, a, a percent estimate of the growth or the, um, the shrinkage of the hippocampus in helping us evaluate cognitive decline. Here is a critical nucleus which we were mentioned, which is involved in the process we were mentioning a few minutes ago. That's the amygdala in the midbrain area and the amygdala is the emotion nucleus of the brain. So again you get repeated um, <clears throat> pushing of this adrenal cortical uh, neurovegetative axis. What's the problem, what's the connection between that and diabetes? Well, <clears throat> this neuroendocrinologist went on to ask the rhetorical question, when do you see an elevated blood glucose and an elevated um, uh, glucagon? Glucagon is a hormone that, uh, that stimulates the liver to release glucose into the bloodstream. Well, <clears throat> if your blood sugar is already high, you should not be releasing more blood sugar from the liver. But you do that in, uh, in uh, two cases. One is when you have diabetes. The other is when you have cortisol release. So again, you start to get that connection between cortisol release and um, diabetes. So <clears throat> uh, believe it or not, we're pushing uh, 10 minutes here. If you're still here, I appreciate your attention and interest. Um, We'll talk a little bit later about uh, other aspects of this area. For example, back in 2014, 2013, there was a lot of work at Yale in terms of discovering a specific nucleus within this midbrain area that uh, controls um, blood glucose. It's a sense, uh, it senses the glucose in the blood. It has nothing to do with our taste of sugar, but 
sensing glucose in the blood and therefore releasing hormones which control our um, diet and therefore uh, our diabetes as well. Thank you again.